Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. In this episode, we are going to take a look at this Fluke PM 6680B. This is a high resolution programmable timer and counter. It actually goes all the way up to 225 megahertz with a 250 picosecond resolution for the timer function. And it has two inputs, input A and input B. Unfortunately, input C option, which I believe goes up to a couple of gigahertz, is not actually installed. So uh, I won't be able to take a look at that. But if you take a look at some of my older videos, there is an, an Agilent frequency counter that I upgrade and I put in one of these modules in there and I describe exactly how it works and what the principle of operation and all that. So if you're interested in that type of thing, take a look at that, it might be interesting to you. Now this was uh, sold on eBay and I bought it as a broken unit. It was listed as non-working and it doesn't turn on and the screen doesn't turn on and so on. So it might be a good candidate for repair. I have also bought a few other things. Hopefully we'll get to repair those as well. And of course, I like to extend my uh, high gratitude for the person who has put a non-removable sticker on the LCD screen of this unit. Um, thank you very much for that. It's a very useful addition to this unit, and uh, taking it off will be quite enjoyable. And so let's go ahead and plug it in, see what happens to it, and then hopefully we can see if we can repair it. It is still a fairly valuable unit. And uh, based on what I understand, I think at least compared to the size that I see here, there should be quite a bit of empty space in this. I haven't opened it yet, I just received it. But then maybe we can do some upgrades to that as well later on, if it's repairable, of course. So first step first, let's plug it in. All right, I'm gonna just plug this in. Let's see at the back. And here it is. Oh, I'm not sure if you guys can hear that, but it is making a rather unpleasant noise. Let me see if we can pick it up from the camera. I don't know, can you hear that? Uh, it's a very classic sound that a DC-DC converter or a switching power supply makes when they are, well, when they're unhappy. And uh, I think that's exactly what's happening in here. Uh, I don't like that, so I'm not gonna keep it plugged in for very long. But the standby light is on. Let's just press this button. Nope. Nothing, the button feels kind of good. Nope, nothing at all. But the light is on, so something is definitely alive, but that sound is uh, is quite bad. So l let me go ahead and unplug it before it blows up. Let's see. Yeah, and the sound slowly dies out as the capacitors discharge. So just from the sound itself, and the fact that the sound slowly goes out, it tells me quite a bit of information about the DC-DC supply or the switching power supply that's in there. Uh, and that can mean that uh, the, in the input is definitely charging up, so likely the rectifier is okay. Uh, so that input capacitor is charging up and then that input capacitor is going to continue to drive the switching portion of the power supply for some time as it degrades and um, the charge dissip dissipates away, the sound slowly dies out. So that means something just from the sound itself. So let's go ahead and, and take the cover off and see what's inside it. I'm sure we want to um, see what kind of power supply it has. Here we are, I took the cover off and it looks kind of funny without the cover because the board is so much thinner and narrower, I should say, than the whole uh, cover, of course. And uh, before I go forward, this used to be my pointing tool and uh, you know a lot of people asked about this, this is used in a machine shop. But uh, anyway, so what happened was that during the Christmas time, one of my viewers went ahead and, and sent me a surprise gift from, from Amazon and uh, I'm, I'm not gonna mention his or her name because uh, I'm not sure if he wants that or she wants that. But uh, anyway, I saw, I'm gonna now switch on to these tools and some of them are actually plastic. So some of you guys were getting nervous when I was pointing with the other stuff. So there you go, a whole bunch of those. Thank you very, very much for sending this uh, in. It was a very nice uh, surprise when I came back from vacation. So we're gonna start pointing with plastic pointers like this one. So let's take a look over here. Obviously the power supply is right there. This does nothing more than just being the GPIB interface because this particular unit has the GPIB uh, upgrade and uh, you know a lot of people still use it. I still use it even sometimes and uh, that's a really really stiff cable that's uh, that's over here. And uh, we see a couple of uh, things here obviously some memory and some processors and there's uh, two different ones that are on a socket. I, I just opened and I haven't seen exactly what's going on. These are the two input channels naturally because they're they, they are right over here in the front of the unit so they are shielded and covered up as to be expected. Other than that a rather uh, simple uh, structure over here. These two things that you see here is where a card would normally slide in, that would be the option and you can see the connector right over here, that's the interface between 
uh, the the card that you would put in here to give the multi gigahertz counter, which is I, I'm assuming is operates exactly the same as the agile one, it divides the signal down within the range of the normal detection. So really nice and straightforward. So I guess our focus will have to start from the power supply. And let's flip this guy over. See what's going on on the other side of this. Here we go. Ah, there it is. Interesting. Uh, in this this plate is a. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of loose sitting over there with these little plastic things. Not too crazy about that. I'm not sure how they're avoiding touching these pins that are right underneath these little flaps. Maybe they're also ground, but anyway, I'll take a closer look at that. Everything else, there's absolutely nothing at the back. There is this interesting cable over here that's looping around with a ferrite core on it. And it has, oh, this actually, oh, I see what they're doing. There's a two cables coming out and going in on a loop and then going back. That's got to be a delay line. Uh, the length for the, implementing a delay that that's probably what that is uh, I'm not hundred percent sure but that I that seems reasonable to me so other than that looks pretty straightforward if I look at it this way nice copper shielding right there in the front really really going out to make sure that this portion of the of the system is insulated so now that we are also have the opportunity to flipping it over we can have a look at the power supply. There's our power supply right there, obviously covered and protected with a symbol right there that do not open, do not touch, the usual stuff because you don't want to kill yourself. And let's see if I can get this thing out of here. There we go, I think I might just move the camera, but there we go, that screw, oh, that's all loose. Now it's been sitting around for a while, so I'm assuming that things are discharged, especially because the sound went away, meaning that there was definitely a discharge going on, but you still have to be careful. There we go, nothing fancy, and oh, look at that. The power supply has a separate module. Uh, unfortunately, damn it, unfortunately it's soldered. Um, you can even see a lot of, uh, I'm gonna have to zoom in to show you later, but there's a lot of flux left over, meaning that they put this module in and they soldered all those points and then they just didn't clean it. Uh, so this module itself is just a power supply. You can clearly see the structure, very, very basic switching power supply there. And uh, the rectifier, which I can't immediately see uh, if it's on this board and over here, but we can discover that shouldn't be too difficult. But uh, this means that this module itself, if it's defective, uh, can be replaced or it's so simple, it doesn't have anything on it. So it's just a bunch of discrete components. We should be able to find a problem with it, hopefully, if that's the issue. My concern is that there's a short somewhere in here or there's something really uh, overdriving, stressing the power supply. And that could be one of the reasons why it's, why it's making that noise. But that is also very easy to find because worst comes to worst, we'll remove this and apply the voltages ourselves to it and see if it powers on. That would be an easy thing to check. Or when you remove it, we power this on, see if the voltages are back to where they're supposed to be. There's lots of options for us to explore. Nonetheless, I'm gonna plug it in one more time over here, if I can find a cable, and we can see if we hear it any better than we did before. I can also bring out the thermal camera and see uh, if uh, we see any tem temperature changes on it. Now, you gotta be very careful again and you can see this has a nice earth uh, reference and it's actually properly crimped and connected with a shake-proof washer to the chassis. So they've done their, their homework. Again, this is Fluke, uh, Philips and Fluke, so they, they know what they're doing. So let's see. You hear that? Sounds very squeaky. And now it's much, much louder. That, of course, sound is emitting uh, from the, the transformer. Yeah, it is not happy. I don't feel any heat coming out of it, but certainly not a heavy power supply. And there it dies. Okay, not bad. So let me situate myself a little better so we can do some voltage measurements. And here is our little power supply. It's nice and neat. And remember that this uh, power supply also supports soft power on and off because the front button is actually a soft power button. So there must be circuitry for that as well. Now before I couldn't see the rectifier, but now I do because I changed the angle I was looking at. And there is our initial rectifier. You can see the input mains cap over there, some more capacitors. And there in there is the thermistor, uh, most likely to prevent inrush of currents and so on. And uh, you can see the fuse right next to it at the back. Now there is another clip where the fuse can go into and at first I thought that was the voltage selection so even depending on where you put the fuse but that's not the case because this thing accepts 90 volts to 265 volts without requiring any modifications. So I'm not sure what that is. Perhaps it can accept a longer fuse or a different fuse configuration that can go uh, over um, the, the further two pads. 
from each other either way pretty straightforward nonetheless so the output coming out of this section is again DC because it's rectified and then it would be uh, going to these two pins are shorter together to this pin over here I'm not sure if you can see that but anyway the two signals are likely over here so then we can actually directly measure it and here's again another big cap there that's rated to 250 volts and then um, is it 250 volts? I would expect that to be a little bit higher actually I can't see unfortunately let me see here no, it's 250 volts, okay, that's fine. And uh, then uh, from there we go into uh, the rest of our uh, flyback converter switching power supply there. And it's very straightforward. This is our main switching transistor uh, with a main heat sink on and the transformer. And these are diodes, and I know because they're labeled as D. Some more filter capacitors there. This component right here where you can see the legs of is an optocoupler. And that obviously is part of the feedback path from the output to regulate and so on. And there's a bunch of components at the bottom. And I know this because obviously the circuitry that controls the uh, switching power supply cannot be found on this side of the board. So it must be on the other side of the board. And once we, hopefully we don't need to take it off, but if you likely have to remove this, and then we will definitely see it. So there's a whole bunch of pins on this side right over here, which connect to the board. Those, these are all soldered, so I have no way of touching them, uh, uh, removing this without um, touch, touch up a solder and remove and remove the solder and get rid of it. But either way, we'll take a look at that. Now, this is not, doesn't seem to be regulated from all of its outputs because I don't see a voltage regulator, and I don't expect it to be on the other side because there are no heat sinks there. But you know, I just realized I see some clips right here on the other side I see what yeah there must be regulators I, I'll show you what the other side is but I think the regulators are on the other side of this connected to this big heat sink and that makes sense because you need that you can't get away with uh, without it and uh, be very careful with these heat sinks especially this one most likely this is live so because uh, I don't see any uh, disconnection I don't see any uh, protection there uh, to, to isolate it, uh, insulate it from there, but you got to be very, very careful. We'll measure it, but I'm fairly sure this will be live. So be very, very careful. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and plug it once again in, and we can measure one step at a time. If I'm interested to see, uh, like I thought, if the rectified voltage is okay there, and that would be a good start. If that is what it should be, you know, roughly the square root of my AC voltage, or square root two times the uh, voltage that I have, and then yeah, I'll be happy with that. And then we can go from that and keep doing measurements. All right, and this thing is plugged in, and I'm just about to measure the voltage after the rectifier to confirm, hopefully, that the rectifier portion is okay. I apologize for the noise; it's extremely annoying, but there's really nothing that I can do about it at the moment. So uh, let's go ahead and very carefully probe that, and I'm gonna go and probe the negative terminal over here. Make sure I have a good solid connection with my hand, and the other one over here. I get, and then I'm gonna look at the multimeter. Ah, there we go, look at that. 168 volts DC with a very small AC ripple on top, which is exactly what you would want to see. And that's a very good sign. It means that, as I suspected, from the uh, just from the sound itself, our rectifier is indeed okay, and it is doing square root two times our AC voltage. And our AC voltage can also be measured, I'm not gonna bother, but certainly it is okay. So that, then we know that the DC voltage is entering uh, the system correctly. Now one other thing that you could do in this case is that I might do is to measure the current that is actually going into the system so you can see if the supply is under heavy load or not. That's another possibility. So now we have to think a little bit more about how to proceed. First thing first, let's remove this monstrosity, the GPIB interface board. There's no reason for it to be there. Furthermore, it will also eliminate one potential problem if there's a short on it um, that is loading the power supply down. Uh, I, again, I doubt that. I, just from observation, this sound takes quite a bit of time to die out. It can be under that much load if that was the case. So that is not likely, but anyway, it will open up. Wow, this thing is really stuck in there. There we go. Uh, it's definitely going to give us more room to work with. And I'm going to remove the screws on that side. I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm just going to go and remove it. There we go, removed. And you know, while I was explaining the power supply and talking about filtering and rectifying, I was saying, eh, something's not right. Where the heck are all our filters? And of course, they are right here. They're out there. Uh, you can see this line outline over here. This is actually still part of the power supply. So there's our comma mode choke and our rectifying filter. Because I was looking, I was like, how can they filter it so well? What is going on here? And of course, here we are. So it is indeed there. So no problem there. I see a, a relay and they have definitely two uh, devices here that are almost certainly uh, definitely are um, going to be our voltage regulators and look at that there is a this is actually really a fairly well silkscreen comments on it 
5 volt adjustment on power module remove cover okay so that potentiometer is a potentiometer and that must be the 5 volt regulator potentiometer and uh, there is uh, well there are two ICs that are not labeled but aha there are some pads in here uh, which I will focus on that actually have some voltages written on them and there's a jumper called jumper 16 load connection disconnect interesting it seems I'm not sure exactly to be honest I'm not sure exactly what that means but uh, maybe it has a, due to its proximity to the power supply maybe it's some kind of a, a debugging or something that we can use there's a bunch of other ones there's J J17 14 um, oh here's our oscillator there you go look at that immediately recognizable so there is our crystal oscillator 10 megahertz which I should say this is just a crystal 10 megahertz and there is a varactor over here a variable capacitor there and that indeed is uh, to tune it so this is going to be used to tune and calibrate this once we measure it and in, in fact if we can fix it that might be something we can try uh, to play around with afterwards but nice and there's battery here to hold the settings or something but it uh, looks pretty good so we can go ahead now and do some measurements here now I am a little bit more hopeful and <laughs> I'm a little bit more comfortable with seeing the components that were missing from the initial assessment but you know I, I don't prepare in advance because I thought it'd be more cool for us to figure it out together like this that's why but it's interesting to find out as we go along big resistor over here as well it's actually offset with uh, uh, either ceramic uh, insulation or I don't think they're ferrite cores but some ceramic insulation pretty cool let's do some more measurements on this so certainly some nice labels over here you can see I see minus 7 volts I see plus 15 I see plus 5 I see plus 7 and I think I saw another one as I was just browsing but certainly they're labeled uh, over there and this relay is still mystery and uh, likely this is part of the soft switch uh, connection from the front so once you press that this will click you know and close the circuit but uh, that's uh, not in being engaged because the voltages are likely not there so very quick and easy and here's a ground there actually so we can easily measure those voltages it should be uh, pretty uh, straightforward to do this and at least get some useful information out of it alright once again let's start the song of the flute people let's plug that in here there it is I think there's a bit of an irony in there or kind of cool I should say I'm using a flute 289 measure a broken fluke um, frequency counter so now let's uh, go ahead and measure those voltages there and uh, actually one thing I wanted to do which I didn't do was to see if that heat sink that I was suspecting would have been live is actually live or not so let me connect this to this ground over here and go on to that heat sink actually let me measure this heat sink this should be ground this is, okay good I can put my finger on it so now I just go ahead and plug touch that over there Oh, ho, ho, ho. yeah, see, minus 80, whoa, minus 83 volts with 72 volts of AC with respect to this ground out here. So definitely live, do not touch that, just as I suspected. Now we can go ahead and measure some of these voltages. So let me plug this guy back over here. Now I see Samson labels, I see plus 7. We can go and measure that. That is not plus 7. There's nothing there at all. That's disappointing. Again, I know that that's nothing, so minus 7. Minus 7 is at oh, minus 3.7. So that's not even close to minus 7. Now minus 15 is plus 7. Uh oh. Oh, wait a second, that's not minus 15, that's plus 15. Whew, thank goodness. I thought the minus 15 was set, sitting at uh, plus 7. That would have been really bad because um, if, it's, if the minus supply is sitting at a positive voltage, that can cause a cascade failure to all the components that are actually expecting um, po positive voltage, uh, negative voltage. So there you go. There's our plus 5 volt supply. Oh, 1.5, 1.7. So yeah, definitely not a happy power supply. Indeed, it's, uh, something's gone horribly wrong with it or it's being pulled down. But uh, I don't think that's the case. So let me, you know what I'm going to do? Let me, let me unplug this for a second. Let me unplug this for a second. Let this guy die out a bit. I'm going to try and just jump this jumper from connect to disconnect. I'm not sure what it does, but it could be that it's part of the startup sequence. I'm not sure. But the, let's get rid of it and put it onto disconnect. And see if that has any impact at all on anything. There we go. The music is back on, and once again, let's measure our plus 15. Come on, ah, same voltage. 
Mm, the same voltage. Everything is exactly like it was before. Yep, nothing. Okay, so then we know something. That power supply has uh, seen better days. So we can now investigate a little further. I didn't want to really remove that power supply completely, so maybe we do a couple of more measurements before we go to that drastic uh, measure and uh, see what we can find out. So I decided to go ahead and remove the power supply and I soldered two of these cables in its place so we can take the output of the rectifier, the 170 volt DC or so, and directly be able to connect it to the power supply. So now it's even more suicide friendly. Uh, but although in a 170 volt DC in here is actually not that harmful, the DC is not so much of a problem up until it reaches about 300, it's the AC that's quite dangerous. Uh, but anyway, so here's the power supply, it's fully taken out, and now you have a much better idea of what it looks like on the other side. And the spacers are actually our HF chokes, which is quite interesting. So they're using these HF chokes not just uh, to connect the power supply and to obviously filter. Thank you, Pooch. That's very helpful. Um, and uh, but also to create a space. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, of course, at the back, we find exactly what we were expecting. There's nothing fancy going on. We have our the DC DC converter uh, IC over there. This is a UC three eight four two eighty. And uh, we'll take a look at that uh, later at the block diagram. And there is also a precision adjustable voltage reference. And that's obviously going to be used for uh, creating the 5 volt supply. The other two supplies are definitely unregulated. And they're just simply a diode rectified, not even fully rectified, just a diode rectified in the capacitor. So we're expecting three outputs, positive, negative around 17 or 18 volts. And of course, the 5 volt, that's the only regulated supply. And that's the one that's in negative feedback with this uh, flyback converter there. So pretty straightforward, very easy. I mean, there's only a few components on this, so it has to be repairable. I mean, unless the transformer is dead, which would be a little bit difficult unless I, I find a replacement. So let's go ahead and uh, plug it into the unit while it's in plugging to the wall. Right now, obviously, nothing is plugged in. That's why my cat was walking all over it. And uh, yeah, then we can go ahead and see what we can do about it. All right, so now we're hooked up back to the unit, and I've taped this down so it doesn't move around, so I can go ahead and probe some stuff. But we should have a fairly good idea of how this works already. And of course, this all relies on this uh, PWM controller, which I've used in one of my previous videos for the magnetic levitation. If you go and look at that, I used one of these PWM controllers intended for DC-DC converters for the magnetic levitation in feedback, where the feedback signal comes from the Hall Effect sensor. So I recommend that you watch that if you want to even get uh, more familiar with it. But either way, this DC-DC converter uh, circuitry is going to drive our switching transistor which is driving the transformer. Now, these three pins right here are the pins from the transistor. We have the gate, a drain and the source. And you can see that the source goes through two very very small resistors. It's about 1 ohm in total, 1.2 ohm in total and then it goes to the body of the heatsink. And then I'm, I can actually use that as a relative ground if I want to uh, poke around with it with an oscilloscope, which I would. And then now uh, we can look at the gate signal and so on. And this obviously is going to drive the gate signal. It has its own RC time constant externally, which we can look at that. That determines the frequency of operation of the DC-DC converter and all that good stuff. And that uh, on the other side of the transformer, then we have the circuitry which compares the output voltage after it's rectified with our 5 volt reference and that 5 volt reference signal then decides uh, whether the comparator in the PWM should increase or reduce the duty, duty cycle and that's handled through of course the opto isolator which is right here between these two. So this is the only connection between the two halves of the circuit and that's of course just for isolation. So it makes uh, sense and everything so we should be able to go ahead poke around and look and see what the voltages are and then uh, see if we need to bring out the oscilloscope and make sure that the signal that drives the switching transistor is strong it's obviously present because otherwise it wouldn't make all that noise but is it strong, is it sufficient amplitude? It is possible that the switching transistor is simply bad and not completely dead but partially uh, damaged and then we, we would replace it so we would find all that out hopefully through some measurements. Now having said all of that because we're going to use this as a reference ground and I, I'm not using an isolation transformer anywhere, uh, I, you have to be very careful because you cannot use a traditional oscilloscope. You might be able to do it depending on how the ground signal is distributed, but just to be on the safe side, I'm going to use a handheld oscilloscope, which is of course isolated from the ground of the instrument. So that way we are safe. We know we can put this as a relative ground because this is not at zero compared to the earth ground, but it wouldn't matter because the instrument is floating also. So we can go ahead and measure it in that way. So I wanted to go ahead and, and do some uh, load test on it. So I plugged everything up. Uh, right now the multimeter is connected to nothing and I've connected the 5 volt output 
directly to my Keithley 2460 and I can use this as, a, as an electronic load, it's a four quadrant instrument of course and it can accept the current, so I set the current to uh, half an amp, right now it's not turned on so obviously you see zero zero volts and there is a, the output is not enabled so the current is not actually being drawn but you know I, op I just tried it just a moment ago and, and I observed something interesting it actually works, it turns on, the voltages are there, all the voltages are correct but the behavior is intermittent and I'll show you what I mean by that so let me go ahead and plug this in there you go, now it makes that little tiny noise and it starts up so the, the loop is actually now closed before the loop wasn't closed for whatever reason and that's why we were getting that, that unusual um, the noise that it was making basically it was sending really sharp pulses into the transformer and that was the noise that you were hearing once the loop is closed you're going to get a nice PWM signal that's fairly stable and the width of the PWM is going to change with how much load is there so now right now I'm getting 4.97 volts you know almost 5 volts and if I go ahead and enable that you can see I can draw half an amp from it and it still works and it's uh, doing the correct thing but uh, let's go ahead and take a look and see what happens when I try to probe the voltage of the reference IC. Remember there's a reference IC right there that's a uh, 5 volt reference and that's an adjustable one because it's, it has a resistor divider on it. Now if I go ahead and, and actually probe that I can just by touching it I can create instability. I know you cannot probably cannot see all of this at the same time. Actually, let me turn the source meter off because it's gonna go go on and the, its fan turns on really fast because it's trying to dissipate the power from inside the unit. I just turned it off so that it's gonna go down. Now when I probe this sometimes, just by probing it, there you go, I just did it. I don't know if you can hear it or not, now fan is on now, but let me see if I can demonstrate this better. So you see how the Every time I touch the reference, it actually becomes unstable briefly. Take a look at the screen of the source meter. Look at the voltage. I'm just going to measure the anode and the cathode of the reference just by measuring the voltage. Look. See that? It just briefly becomes unstable. The loop becomes open and then it locks back again. And that's weird because the reference I see should have a very small impedance. It's supposed to act almost like a zener. So I don't know why it's doing that. It could be that it's defective and that it is partially working and its load handling capabilities is completely destroyed. That's one possibility. I have seen sometimes something like this also when the optocoupler was bad. But this is my, my first guess. Unfortunately, I don't have a replacement like that. So I'm going to go ha have to go ahead and order it and then when it comes back uh, and replace it and see if this actually solves the problem because the, the issue is uh, the performance is intermittent sometimes it comes and sometimes it goes and that it's not because it's mechanically disconnected because just by measuring it I can disrupt it so it's not a mechanical problem it's something else so let's go ahead and order some parts and then we can take a look at it again here let me demonstrate once again this problem that I was talking about listen you hear that? It's it's continues to lock and unlock from the loop and look at the voltage I have no load on it now it's completely unloaded and it still does that so that's why I'm suspecting that perhaps then there's an issue with that reference and it's it just doesn't have any um, good drive capability so the reference degrades and then the supply disconnects and reference recovers and it just is stuck in this oscillation essentially so that's my, my could be one possibility and uh, well we can replace it it's an inexpensive component it's a good way to start and with the magic of television, we have a replacement part. Whoa, that's bright. So let's go ahead and uh, replace that little reference IC and see what happens. All right, step one, remove the old IC. Now we put a new one in. All right, so the chip has been replaced and I'm connecting it to the 2460 once again. And let's go ahead and plug it in, see if it's uh, working. Before I start shocking myself here. Let's see and there we go not bad I don't hear any of that weird noise it was making anymore sounds good let's enable the current there you go taking half a million half an amp from it seems to be okay what about uh, 750 million yeah it's good I'm not sure how much it's supposed to provide but it's providing put, push it to one amp I guess oh not one amp minus one amp yeah, looks 
reasonable. I mean, it's giving me one amp um, at five volts, and of course the 2460 is going nuts. But it seems fine in this connect. It recovers back nicely. Try this a few times. Yeah, doesn't seem to be unstable anymore. That's a good sign. So maybe, maybe we can try putting it back inside the uh, instrument here and see if it recovers. I mean, it's really easy to put it back because I have to just solder those joints again. That would be a start. Alright, here we go. Gonna plug this guy back in. I already installed the power supply. And... Ah, there you go. Ta-da! No problem. Back to life. Now I should be able to turn it off. Yep, I should be able to turn it back on. In fact, I can. No problems. Get away, pooch. Yeah, so it works. Uh, now the question is whether it actually works, works. And it can count frequency like it is supposed to. So uh, let's try that. Um, one of the things I also want to do is uh, describe actually how this instrument works since we already opened it. I don't think I described the operation of the other counter, but this one I like to maybe just briefly go over it and show you and then we can try the two input channels and see what happens. And also I have no idea how good the calibration of this thing is and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So as it is customary, we want to understand the component that we just replaced in the power supply. And here is the internal schematic and a equivalent circuit of this TL431 reference. Now the interesting thing about this reference is it has a built-in 2.5 volt reference internally already. And it also has an error amplifier shown by all these devices that you see here. And you can see that this error amplifier has several current meters followed by this cascode of current meters which ultimately feeds these two uh, inverters, PNP and NPN type inverters, and then the output of that is taken and fed into this Darlington pair transistor. And the output of that Darlington pair transistor is then connected directly to the cathode and anode of the circuit. So what this means is that if you were to take feedback from the cathode onto the reference, you could then shift the output voltage away from the internal 2.5 volt reference to pretty much anything that you want up to about 36 volts or so in here and the equivalent circuit of that would look like this here's our error amplifier over here which is all these circuits over here here's our reference voltage internally which is embedded in here then we have our Darlington transistor which here is shown as a single device over there across this uh, transistor at the output and the reference voltage is over here and that's how you can adjust the output. There's a lot of different cool things you can do with it. Most of the time people use it in negative feedback so that there is some kind of a negative feedback between the cathode and the reference. Now because this is a fully bipolar implementation, you can't just leave a lot of these things floating because these things require base current and you have to have external circuitry to support that and that is indeed on the power supply already. Now if I go down a little bit, just wanted to show you something very very simple and straightforward. Sorry about scrolling here. I think I saw it before. Here we go. For example, this would be actually no, that's not the one I wanted to show you. Where did it go? Ah, here we go. There it is. So here's a very simple example of a precision 5 volt reference that's capable of providing a lot of current. So here this is the equivalent model of the TL431. You can see it has the, the cathode and the anode and our reference voltage over here and here they're connected into an output power transistor and this is our, you know, here is shown as the battery voltage but it can be anything, your power supply and there is uh, some base current being provided here into the cathode and there is a uh, should be in, in order to make sure that the cathode actually has a one milliamp of current remember if you don't provide the cathode with at least a milliamp of current then the error amplifier built into the 431 will not have sufficient current to stay in the active region and therefore it will not be able to adequately operate and that's to be expected again this is a bipolar implementation that's normal in analog circuit design so then you have this guy with a voltage divider and you can see they're using 0.1% reference resistors because they want to get a precision 5 volt and then the vision of that goes into the view reference and then you can get your nice 5 volt coming out. So it's a very simple circuit. It's not the most efficient circuit because you're going to have the drop between the 5 volt and the V battery directly across your device which is going to burn up and uh, turn into heat essentially. It's just V times I, power dissipation through other resistor. But it's a, a very simple example on how to do this. And they also show some PWM version of this where you still generate your reference and you have your feedback coming from somewhere else. And you know, pretty, pretty interesting and straightforward uh, component that I just wanted to give you uh, an idea. Every time I repair something, I always show the data sheet of the component or the components that I'm replacing. And this one, this happens to be the one. So I think it's pretty cool. Take a look at it and uh, maybe you can use it in one of your own projects. So we saw how the reference regulator 
precision reference that I replaced inside the power supply look like. By the way, I also replaced um, two of the capacitors, which were okay. I actually took them out, they measured them. They were okay. They were measuring a little bit high on the ESR, but well within what would be acceptable. I replaced them anyway, just because I think they were getting old. But other than that, I did nothing else. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, take this little cover off here. Uh, this thing, uh, you got to be very careful with these because these metal pieces are actually really sharp. Oh, you know what? This actually has to lift off, I think. There we go. That's how it should be. There it is. Yeah, these guys are, uh, are quite sharp and you definitely do not want to be at the wrong end of these things because they will cut you. There we go. There it is. Come on. It's an unusual little cap and the input is very straightforward. We have a bunch of relays there. Now, actually, let me zoom in a little bit because I'm only going to describe very briefly the operation of this. So the two channels are obviously independent and uh, the two channels only meet up at the very end because this thing has some functions where the, it compares the two channels in terms of timing and so on and delay and things like that so there is some commonality at the very end of the chain now the inputs are supposed to be either 50 ohm or they could be 1 mega ohm and they could have a times 1 or a times 10 multiplier so they have a bunch of different functionality and remember this thing supports 225 megahertz which means that there are amplifiers in here to amplify the signal to ensure that this can count a minimum signal level so the functionality of these pads are going to be things like uh, input attenuation, input limiters, input amplifiers, which can be multi-stage or it can be uh, multi-frequency paths in parallel to flatten the frequency response. It got, it's got different relays along the path to switch between the different impedance modes and the different multiplier factors and so on, all of them are going to be embedded in here. And you can see a couple of different, different adjustable capacitors. There's a whole bunch of adjustable capacitors, in fact, here to equalize the frequency response and to tune things and make sure that you can count reliably across the entire range. But ultimately, at the very end of the day, the very simplified method of operation has to do with basically counting pulses. You have a reference. In this case, we have this rather pathetic uh, crystal, 100 mega, uh, 10 megahertz reference here, with, which has a variable capacitor right next to it, likely to tune it. And this is the only thing I'm going to play around with um, to try and calibrate and adjust it later on. And it's got a, a couple of ASICs which do nothing more than basically doing this uh, pulse counting and comparing with how many counts you gain from the 10 megahertz reference. Now, obviously, this is a very simplified description of it because there's a lot of things that go in the background, but you're basically doing that. And other than that, it's really straightforward. If you were to add the, you know, several gigahertz uh, expansion here, as I explained in a different video, that expansion just amplifies limits divides with a static divider and then the divided signal will be within the counting range of this instrument once again <clears throat> and then you're going to be able to basically measure high frequencies that's that's how this one works now if you watch my another repair video where i repaired a, an hp 5347a which is a 20 gigahertz counter the principle of operation of that one is completely different. That one depends on a step recovery diode and it creates a coma frequencies and it mixes them and it picks one and then the IF uh, generator analyzes that. So there's a lot of information available already on my channel about this type of instruments and I recommend that you take a look at it. Now, having said all of that, well, I want to calibrate this. Well, what are our options to calibrate it? Well, here at the signal path, we are never short of options. So let's take a look and see what we can actually do. Well, we can do something simple we can calibrate using an oven controlled crystal oscillator like this one. This is a, a 10 megahertz one, this is made with PTI. Very, very straightforward. Oh, I just lost one of the pads. I could have picked that up later. This is a very simple uh, unit. It has a tune voltage, so you can slightly tune it, offset it, or leave it alone and expect to get a 10 megahertz that this was designed for. Obviously, the ovenized crystal keeps the crystal at a certain temperature, stabilizes the temperature so that the drift over time can be minimized. These things can be really good, really accurate. Almost every synthesizer that you buy is going to have one of these. Now, these come in different grades and so on and on. So that's one of the uh, differentiating factors of these. Well, I also have more of these. I have this one, 10 megahertz one. It's actually a slightly better one. And uh, this one I'm uh, splitting into three so that I can use it for uh, synchronizing multiple instruments. So we have this option as well. I have an older one. Ooh, there we go, Did not break anything. I have an older one. And the reason I'm showing this one is that it's, it has a mechanical fine and coarse tuning. And this mechanical fine and coarse tuning are two screws. By tightening them, you're actually putting physical pressure on the crystal. 
by deforming it in a certain way and that allows in some cases to change its frequency because after all the frequency operation of the crystal is a property of its dimension it's a physical property of the crystal itself its resonance uh, based on this dimension or we can get more fancy we can get this one this is an fe 405b here we go. And the nice thing about this one is it's actually 15 megahertz. This is a double ovenized, even more stabilized uh, mechanism for creating a reference voltage. This is a very high-end crystal and its performance is not as good as a rubidium, but pretty close. And in fact, they use it for timing uh, in very, very sensitive uh, situations, even in base stations. Uh, now we also have, of course, the, the fantastic rubidium standard. I have two of them here this one and this one and both of these as you know rubidium standards an atomic standard these are made by datum and this one by this company called Ephratum. i don't know i've never heard of this company before but these guys uh, make rubidium standards and these guys because of the atomic principle because the decay is an is a function of the uh, radioactive decay of a component of an element i should say it's very accurate because it's quite predictable physical model of how the universe works in a way. So these guys are going to be very stable, they don't drift and uh, they have to heat up and of course to stabilize and lock and so on but other than that really really cool and there's lots of information available about how rubidium oscillators work. So we have all these options to uh, tune this thing and uh, to be honest given the fact that it has just a crystal in there with a a variable capacitor which is not even organized I'm not even sure if it's temperature compensated really calibrating it with the rubidium would be kind of ridiculous so let's just make it very simple and calibrate it with one of these uh, more basic oscillators either this one or even this one would be more than enough for the purposes of seeing if it can actually tune it or not so let's connect this one up and see if it works and we can calibrate it and here we go we have the unit plugged directly into our oven control crystal oscillator. I've let everything sit for quite some time to come up to temperature and stabilize. That includes both the crystal as well as the instrument itself. So there you go and uh, you see it's working. I tried the other channel. The other channel works just as well. So no problems there at all. And uh, as you can see the frequency is well, it's actually quite off. So let's go ahead and see if we can uh, cal this guy out. Uh, if I can find that little point where this is supposed to go. There we go. I think I've got it in there. Let's see if we can... Whoa, that is very sensitive. There we go. Come on. You gotta kind of split the atom with this thing. Oh, no. That's going to be very difficult. Oh. Oh, look at that. Oh, man. Yeah, this must be really fun to watch. Ah, oh, that's not good enough. I'm going to be up the whole night trying to do this now. This was a disaster. Oh, just putting the screwdriver on it. Oh, just anyway, but you get the idea. And uh, let's see, it's, you know, it, once I leave it, it's kind of stable. It's actually counting down, interestingly enough. There it is, it's pretty close now. I guess it's gonna come back. Oh no, wait a second, it just keeps going. You know what, it's close enough as far as I'm concerned. Look at all those zeros. Oh, it's going the other way. Anyway, but it's, working quite nicely you can see you can count there's a bunch of other varactors uh variable capacitors and so on which i'm not tuning which i assume this has to do with the frequency response all that as i explained but it looks good let's measure some higher frequencies with it there you go i think i almost got it i put it back into hertz um, and there it is 10.000 lots and lots of zeros and it looks good so now i want to measure uh, using the same setup i'm going to use the Azure and EXG, and that's going to allow us to change the power as well as the frequency all the way up to the rated 225 megahertz just to make sure everything is good and that everything works. And here's the Keysight uh, synthesizer. This one is, uh, you can see it's about 5 hertz off, but I just turned it on, so it's not really up to temperature. And that crystal that I used, I'm not really sure how accurate it was, and uh, it was just something that was lying around, but it's very reasonable. Let's go ahead and increase the frequency to 100 megahertz. I'm putting in 0 dBm into the instrument and you can see that indeed we are recording 100 megahertz without any issues and we can go that should be 200 there you go that is 200 in fact very nice and 220 and it does indeed go to 230 40 50 80 there you go it keeps going 
Uh, no, there you go. So 350 looks like anything above that and you're going to run into problems at least at 0 dBm. So let's go down to 200 and let's see how low we can go in power before it starts making mistakes. So it's right now 0 dBm. Let's go to... No, that cannot do that. There you go, minus 16 dBm is fine, 17 dBm is good, 18 is good. There you go, minus 18 dBm, give or take a little bit because of the loss in the cable, it's okay. Uh, you can measure power pretty small values as well, and it doesn't do a very good job at minus 18 dBm, but it looks like at like minus 15 dBm, you're going to get a pretty stable reading. So 199.9999 megahertz. So I think it looks good. There's only one other thing I wanted to do, just to measure its power consumption, and that should be it. So there was something else I wanted to quickly measure, and that was the standby power consumption of this unit. So right now it's turned off, and as you know, the power supply is actually on, because it says that this thing has a soft power switch. And look, it's burning 71 milliamp uh, from 120 volts here in the United States. Why? That's almost 10 watts. What is it using 10 watts for? It doesn't have an oven-controlled crystal, which it has to keep in temperature. It's just It's been sitting on for a while. I don't understand why it has to burn 10 watts. 10 watts is a lot of power, uh, which is you just throwing away if this thing is plugged in. And if I go ahead and turn it on, you can see that it goes to two, uh, 200 uh, milliamp, ah, which is fine when it's running, I, I can understand. But to burn yeah, to burn that much current when it's not running, ugh, yeah, not, I'm not very happy about that. But anyway, uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed this video. There's a whole bunch of stuff here, which I thought were quite fun, especially the repair part. If you liked, let me know, leave me a comment. And I have another actually fluke um, instrument, which I'm going to keep secret. That's going to be uh, my another uh, repair video after this. And there's a bunch of reviews and a whole lot of stuff. It's just not enough time. So I hope I hear from you soon. Eh? Until next time.